Hey, Green Hill Church family and friends, today is Tuesday, June the 2nd, but you're hearing this on June 3rd as a part of the Midweek Connection. And I usually have graphics behind me, but I wanted to come and find a little quieter spot on our campus and just uh, stop for a minute on our Colossians study, although Colossians 3 has some things that I really am looking forward to sharing with you. But uh, there's been some uh, circumstances and situation over the last few days that I think is really important for us just to take a moment for. Uh, certainly the tragic death of George Floyd in Minneapolis last week uh, captured our hearts. Uh, all of us, no matter who we are, where we've come from, uh, we can look at that video and understand the circumstances around that and, uh, and, and we are grieved. Our hearts are broken, all of us collectively and individually. And then since then, we've seen uh, uh, civil protests taking place that have, uh, many of have, have turned into rioting in our cities and uh, violence and destruction and things that aren't, aren't helpful at all to the cause of justice or the cause of c civil discourse or progress in this um, uh, battle that we face or this, this issue that we face that is still upon us in terms of uh, race in America and all of that. Um, but I did wanna stop just a moment and share with you just my heart about a couple of things. Uh, first of all, as a gospel preacher, as a pastor of a local church, um, I could stop every day and talk about cultural or social issues that are in the news headlines. If we stopped every day and addressed every issue, that's all we would ever do. And I've said this before, but you can be a pastor or you can be a pundit, but you can't be both. And so I'm a pastor, I'm not a pundit, and so I don't really think it's my job or the church's role to speak to every single news story that comes across the news feed. Uh, so that's first. Second, our job is to share the gospel and to uh, teach the Bible and share the good news of Jesus and um, see that people are uh, moving from death to life and then uh, helping them become disciples who follow Jesus, who make disciples who follow Jesus. That's our mission, to make disciples of Jesus who lives for his kingdom. And so that's our core, that's what we do. But from time to time, there are occasions, and it seems like in the last, I don't know, couple of years, there's been more occasions for us to speak that uh, we just felt it was necessary to, to uh, bring the gospel uh, to bear on the current events of our day. And you just gotta know as a pastor, when to speak and when not to speak is a really tough thing to discern. And so if you think I talk too much about these things, I understand that. If you think I don't talk enough about these things, I understand that as well. Uh, we uh, aren't always sure exactly uh, what to do or what to say or when to say it or how to say it. And so you'll understand that. So a lot of grace is, is important for all of us. But one of the things that I've noticed that this moment allows for us to do is to discern or to determine how then we live in a community and in a culture that um, is so ravaged by anger and by division and by uh, political tribalism and social tribalism. And now what I find in just uh, solid Bible-believing churches is theological tribalism, if that's even a term. Um, Jesus in the great, in, um, sorry, in the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest message ever preached by the greatest preacher to ever preach a message, right? Uh, he said this in Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 43. He says, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, I want you to know for a moment, uh, love your neighbor is in the Bible. That's Leviticus 19. Uh, hate your enemy, not in the Bible. It was a uh, cultural expectation that if you loved your neighbor, then you would hate your enemy. Like, uh, it, was, it was a... Uh, cultural way of life, even for the religious people, even for the Jewish people. Jesus said, you've heard it said, love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your father in heaven. For he cares, of, I'm sorry, for he causes his son to rise on the 
evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward will you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? You know, the most despised, corrupt people that uh, they could name. He said, if you only greet your brothers and sisters, uh, what are you doing out of the ordinary? Don't even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Wow. Jesus turns all the conventional wisdom upside down. And he says, I know that you're conditioned to love your neighbor and to hate your enemy. But I'm telling you something else. I'm telling you to love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. And as you may or may not know, the word love is the word of sacrificial love or covenant love. It's this, it's this love that lays down its life for a friend, right? Uh, it's this uh, love that will cost you something. So he's saying, in essence, I want you to love your enemy in a way that it will cost you and your friends. I want you to give up your rights and privileges in order to prefer others over yourself. Jesus did that, and Philippians 2 tells us about that. It's a wonderful Christological hymn that Paul shares and uh, reminds us of what Jesus has done for you and me, that he disrobed all the rights and privileges of deity, put those, that robe of, aside, and uh, took on the, the robe of flesh uh, and he became incarnate and he dwelt among us and he ultimately gave his life for us. And so um, his sacrifice was what made it possible for us to be redeemed and reconciled to God. Uh, so you see, the stakes are high when it comes to this kind of love. In other words, Jesus isn't saying, you know, I know you don't feel like it. And I, I understand that, that it may be inconvenient. But if you could, I'd like for you to love your enemy. I'd like for you to love those who oppose you. I'd like for you to love your political rival. I'd like for you to love the people you don't agree with about many important things. I want you to love those people. He, didn't, he wasn't suggesting it. It wasn't a matter of convenience. It was a command. He, he's more pointed in this command when he's answering this, the, the, the question of the inquiring scribe who said, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus said to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And they, the Jewish audience understood that as the, from De Deuteronomy 6, which uh, was called the Shema, which means listen up. So that's how, the, that's how that text in Deuteronomy 6 started. Listen up, hear, O Israel, our God is one. Um, he said, I want you to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then from Leviticus 19 again, I want you to love your neighbor as yourself. Matthew records that Jesus said that in these two commands, all the law and the prophets is fulfilled. Wow. Again, he doesn't, he doesn't give us a lot of out. There's no wiggle room there in terms of how we love God and how we love neighbor. And then I think of John. Uh, John. The Gospel of John is so profound. And there's this theme, the, there's these multiple themes in John that are just incredibly rich. But we come to 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. And John says stuff like this, and I don't have it right in front of me, so I'm, I'm paraphrasing. But he, he said in 1st John 1, 9, this is a quote, If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But he goes on and he says things like, if you say you love God, but you don't love your brother, what is that? He said, if you have fellowship with God, then you will have fellowship with one another. In other words, there's this expectation that repentance, that confessing sin, repenting, being reconciled to God will naturally produce a love for other people. A love for other people. A love for neighbor, 
those that are easy to love, that are close to us, that uh, are more like us, and love for our enemy, those people that aren't exactly like us, those people that have different views than we do politically or socially, those people that look different or come from a different family background. We're loving those people who may not be just like us. Again, it's not a command. It is a natural expectation of a Jesus follower to obey Jesus. And when he says to love, your, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, when he says love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you, he's not asking. He's saying, listen, I died in your place. I have redeemed you. You are my own. I have purchased you. Your life is hidden in mine, which gives you the ability and the responsibility to love. A lot of us think that our power in the public square is um, how loud we can be, how venomous we can be. And I see this um, across the board, whether you're kind of coming from the left on things, you know, the political left or even the theological left, um, if you're coming from the right uh, politically or theologically, we see it everywhere. Uh, we, some of us were talking this morning among our, our pastors, we're talking in just discussing that whether it's on the right or to the left, we can neglect the core admonition of Jesus, which is to love. You say, well, Daryl, that sounds really squishy and all that, but what about, you know, what about truth? I mean, what about right and wrong? Yeah, that's important. Right and wrong are important. But Jesus said all the law and the prophets are fulfilled in this command that you love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Um, one of the things that's, I think, important also if we really l believe the gospel and believe that the gospel is the only hope for the world. In John chapter 17, Jesus is praying this, what we know as the high priestly prayer. And he prays something like this. Again, it's a paraphrase, but he says to the Father, Lord, make them one as you and I are one, so that the world would know that you sent me. In other words, the, the ver ver veracity of the gospel is demonstrated in the faithfulness that believers have to love one another. It, it, could it be that the gospel, the truth of the gospel, that Jesus is the only way to a relationship with God that would last forever, that Jesus is the only way, the only remedy for our sin, the only conquer over sin, death, and the grave, the only escape that any of us have from a sinner's hell? Could it be that our message has gotten muted a little bit because we simply have refused to love one another? And that's all of us. Now, I want to be really clear with you as a pastor to its people and friends of mine that may be listening in. I don't know, really, I don't personally know anyone in my church or anyone in my circle of influence that's just a rotten to the core racist. I just don't, I don't know that. Here's what I do know is that it's easy. It's, it's easier not to love others than to love others. Like love is not simply a sentiment. It is a sacrifice. So I don't think any of us are going to, first of all, make a lot of progress with each other with condemning and condescending and um, pointing our, wagging our finger at one another. We're just not going to make much progress. Uh, we may not be looting buildings, but that kind of condescension and that kind of, of um, critical spirit is not going to be very helpful. But what is helpful is that when we step in and we engage with other people, when we engage with people who aren't like us. So uh, several years ago, I was privileged to be able to b become friends with uh, some African-American um, brothers here in our community. And I was able to sit down with them and just talk with them frankly as I knew how about where they were, where they've come from, what they see, and not one of them wagged their finger at me. Not one of them accused me of being a racist. Not one of them accused my church of being a racist church. But what they did notice is that we just don't seem to care a lot about where they live and what they deal with every day. Again, they weren't an accusatory. Matter of fact, they're a little easier on uh, white folks than maybe a guy like me would be 
you know, on my church family. They are showing more grace than you can ever imagine. And they're encouraging me to show grace because, again, they know that wagging fingers and throwing rocks is not a way to um, bring any kind of light to the situation or any progress uh, to this terrible attitude and division that we often uh, see and face. But they, what they were encouraged by was our willingness to engage, to sit down and share a meal together, to ask questions and to hear their story. And it's a real story. You say, well, you know, Daryl, there's all kinds of uh, discrimination around the world. There's all kinds of dis types of discrimination. And there, there's all kinds of types. You're exactly right. But in America, um, overwhelming uh, um, proportion of discrimination has been borne by uh, African Americans. And I think it's important that we as uh, a primarily white community, a white church, and just understand that and just show some love. We know that only the gospel changes a heart. Only the gospel does that. We know that everyone is born or created in the image of God, bears the stamp of the image of God, is worthy of respect. There's just one race. There's lots of ethnicities, there's lots of nationalities, there's skin colors different. There's just one race and we're all sons and daughters of Adam and Eve. We all came from the same place, all from the dust of the ground, all stamped with the image of God. All worthy, therefore, of respect and dignity and love. And so uh, my prayer is, again, um, that the gospel would be launched out from this place, this physical platform, that week in and week out you would hear the Bible taught faithfully, expositionally, that you would hear the, the gospel preached and the good news of the, of the gospel that Jesus has come as the sinless Son of God, he, was, he lived an innocent life and died an innocent death, was buried and on the third day was raised from the dead. And that the gospel is still the power to move people from death to life. But those who are in Christ do have a responsibility under the Lordship of Jesus to love our neighbors as ourselves, to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. I want to come back to that text just for a moment. Anybody can love the people that agree with us. All of us kind of gravitate to people who are like us, who agree with us. Jesus said, what reward is that? There's no reward in that. He said, but there is reward. There is completion. There is perfection, if that's the right word. He's not talking about sinless perfection. He's talking about coming to complete end to what God has called us to do and who God has called us to be when we love people that are a little harder to love, when we love sacrificially in a way that costs us and our church family, our nuclear family, our friendships, when it costs us a piece of ourselves to love our enemy and to pray for those who may persecute us for the gospel's sake. I've noticed over the last few days, well, few years really, a, a public discourse that doesn't sound very loving. I've even been guilty, I'm sure, of it. I want you to know that whoever's in office, whoever's in the responsibility of mayor or HOA president or uh, president of the United States. That person is a human being also created by God, bears his image. And slam dunking our leaders on social media isn't very compelling. Slamming one another on social media and in the public square doesn't help us fulfill John 17, Jesus' prayer that we would be one as the Father and the Son are one. That the world would know that the Father sent the Son to redeem the world. 
It doesn't go very far in doing that. The president, your HOA board members, your mayor and commissioners, they're human beings. And uh, like the song says, you know, God is still working on me to make me what I ought to be. It took him just a, a week to make the moon and the stars, the earth and the something and Jupiter and Mars. But oh, how loving he must be. He's still working on me. He's still working on you too. And he's still working on the president. And he's still working on those who are in leadership. But they're not, not going to know the good news of the gospel if you slam dunk every bad move they make. The people that are listening to you and watching who aren't in the game at all, but they're watching, they're not going to be very compelled to follow the one you call Lord if you and I aren't willing to love like he's called us to love. So my prayer for you and for me, for Green Hill Church, is that we would be a light on a hill, literally Green Hill, that we would be a light from this place sharing boldly the good news of the gospel, making no apology that Jesus is the only way and that the Bible is completely true in every way, in every word, in every syllable. It is inspired by God and it is profitable for teaching, for correction, for training in righteousness. Make no apologies for that. But the world will know that Jesus is their Savior because of the way that we love one another. It's my prayer here in the middle of the week as we prepare to reopen and reset our church that we would be known by our love. Hey, God bless you. Thank you. I miss you deeply. I cannot wait to see you in person. See you Sunday, June 7th, June 14th after that. Lord willing, God bless you.